In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we find ourselves the first Sunday in Lent, and we perhaps expect to have the traditional uh, account that most of us remember of Jesus' temptations in the wilderness. But we get a rather different introduction to those temptations in these words from Mark, great brevity. Um, but I think that may be a gift to us this year, because you and I may feel that we have been in something of a wilderness for rather a long time over this past year. And, and perhaps we might therefore want to look at Lent a little bit differently. The word Lent originates from the word lengthen, uh, as the days literally get longer. And um, a commentator I was listening to referred this week to Lent as a spiritual springtime, which I thought was rather nice. Uh, so perhaps we might think about how we can prepare this Lent for that spiritual springtime. And what we have in the account from Mark is uh, this very different perspective. We hear God affirming Jesus as his beloved son. Uh, after a short description of the wilderness, he then proclaims the good news. And in proclaiming that good news, he is reinforcing the good news of the covenant that God makes that we heard about in our first reading today. So let's come to that first reading. The flood has taken place, that great catastrophe has occurred. Uh, Noah in the ark uh, with all the animals uh, has come to dry land. And so we come to this reset in God's relationship with humanity. A new start, a new normal we might say building back better in that phrase that seems to be creeping in rather a lot. And God does this through the means of the covenant. Now, in the Old Testament, there are a number of different covenants that God makes with his people, with Abraham, with Moses, with his other leaders. But this is different, not only because it's the first one, but it's a covenant with all creation. It's another of those reminders of the centrality of creation in our understanding of God and our faith. The covenant is with all living creatures, not just with humanity. And God uses another sign from his creation, the rainbow, to visualise that covenant that he is making. And of course, the sign of the rainbow has been used ever since as a symbol of liberation for enslaved people by the LGBT community and most recently as a sign of solidarity with the NHS and key workers during the pandemic. And it's important to note that a covenant is not a contract, particularly not this one. The obligation made by God is a, is a unilateral one. It's not dependent on our response to him. God commits never again to destroy the earth because of humanity's actions. In fact, it's sobering to think that it's more likely that it is humanity which may destroy the earth now. So it's a commitment that God makes, and he makes it forever. And as I've said, not just with humanity, but with every living creature. And so we come then to the account from Mark's Gospel, and it provides a wonderful, short, pithy primer for us at the start of, uh, of Lent. Mark is the shortest Gospel anyway, and Mark always focuses on the essentials of our faith. And in these few verses, we have Jesus' baptism, temptations in the, in the wilderness, and the proclamation of the good news. Now, of course, Jesus doesn't need to be baptised, but he does so because in baptism, he identifies with you and me in our fallen state. John the Baptist has been out in the wilderness, proclaiming the need for a baptism of repentance. And so Jesus comes to John the Baptist. And at the start of Lent, it's an affirmation for us of the place of baptism in our own lives. And if we, even if we haven't been baptised, of that uh, core encounter that you or I have had with God, uh, that first love, if you like, that we should be going back to and removing all of the dross that has got in the way of our relationship with God uh, 
Let's do that during this season uh, of Lent. And we hear the voice of God affirming Jesus as his beloved son. Good news in that statement about Christ. And so then the same spirit that rests upon Jesus in the form of a dove in his baptism then immediately drives him out into the wilderness. And you might like to look at the Lent course that we're following this year, which Richard Sewell has put together in Jerusalem in the first uh, part of that. If you watch the video in that, you'll see Richard out in the Judean wilderness, describing actually what it is like. It's not a sea of sand like we might visualise the desert. It's a rocky place, but it's also a place that has uh, these wadis, these river ravines, uh, where there is also life which springs up around those. So it's a much more multi-layered place, uh, the wilderness, than we might imagine. Um, and that rather well describes the experience uh, that Jesus undertook in going into the wilderness. Undoubtedly a tough experience, 40 days and 40 nights alone there. Doubtlessly hunger part of that. But we also here now find another creation reference uh, of the wild beasts being there with Jesus. Uh, some of you may know that painting by Stanley Spencer of Jesus holding the scorpion in the palm of his hand. It's a wonderful image of that coming together with God's creation. And he's also attended by the angels. So there's a sense here of a reset of what happened in the Garden of Eden, that the uh, enmity between uh, the, the snake uh, and uh, living, other living creatures and humanity is in some ways restored here with the attendance of the wild beasts. And similarly with the angels waiting upon Jesus, the divine and humanity are brought together in harmony again. And the account of Jesus in the wilderness provides for us a, a pattern which we can use for our observance of Lent. We can do with spending time away from our usual distractions, dealing with the inevitable temptations that will arise for us if we try to do that. We have to work our way through that to the other side. Be more at one with the environment around us and drawing closer, therefore, to God. There is discomfort, but there is also a sense of liberation in that experience. Just as the people of Israel spent 40 years going through the desert uh, to come to the promised land, just as Jesus himself draws at one with his heavenly Father in his baptism and in the experience of the wilderness, uh, at the start of his ministry, so we in this season of Lent can be released, liberated, for listening to the true voice that God is calling us at this time. And so we come then to the good news that Jesus proclaims. And it's good to be reminded that our faith and our is good news. It's so often perhaps our relationship with God doesn't feel like that. Certainly often the image of the church and the understanding of the church doesn't feel like that. Some of the times the way that the faith is explained um, sounds like, well, it is good news if you do it in a certain way, but if you don't do it that way, it's very bad news. It's good news. And in the reading we could have, we could have had the epistle set for today, we hear of Jesus uh, in that gap between his death on the cross and his resurrection on the third day, going to proclaim the good news to the spirits in prison. There is no limit to the good news of Christ that we are able to proclaim. And the, Jesus says that the kingdom has come near. Can you see signs of the kingdom around you here in Barnes and further afield? Lent is an opportunity to open our eyes afresh to that and to join in with those things where we see the kingdom really happening. Most of all, the kingdom is personified in Jesus himself. If we want to know what God's kingdom, God's way looks like, we look at what Jesus does and says.
Indeed, we could say that God's rainbow covenant is made flesh in Jesus. And that's why we speak of uh, the new covenant that we have in Christ through his death and resurrection. And that is what we celebrate at every service of Holy Communion. And so, at the start of this season of Lent, let's be assured of God's covenant of love and of grace. Let's have that image of the rainbow held before us as we journey through these coming days. Let us uh, look at this uh, perhaps slightly different approach to Lent, not as one of uh, simply those things that we give up in some form of uh, uh, self-flagellation, which is often the danger of Lent. Let us rather step aside from our usual patterns in order to experience that liberation, to experience that good news that we find when we come face to face with our loving God. And so then we will be able to, in turn, live out and proclaim that good news. And the rainbow is that image, isn't it, of sun and rain together. We need both of those. And we're in a rainbow time at the moment, aren't we? as we experience still lots of the hardships of the lockdown. But we have the tantalising glimpse of the sun ahead. And so let's treat these days as rainbow days in which we can draw closer to God, really experience his good news and look forward with deep hope to the future.